do you know this problem? You got out quite a lot of great implicit data. You look at the data and you think to yourself, what does it really mean? How can I interpret the physics of oh, my dear? So this situation is really like, like a physician who looks at the diagnostics. Oh, high blood pressure. Is this really an alcoholic? Or you look at a drowsiness. Does he really have a brain tumor? So the link is not always, always clear. And we at Success Brothers have specialized in the, the thing to find the link between the success factors and the link between the implicit measures and the buy button in your brain. And in the next 20 minutes, we would like to show you how to gain such insights and how this leverages the quality validity of insights by factor three. So we illustrate everything with four hopefully interesting examples. Con Sir Condole said once, good information are hard to get. It's even harder to make use of them. And implicit data are such very useful, useful information. But our point today is, it needs more than looking at the data. Uh, being, being angry can, can mean quite a lot of different stuff to, to whether or not someone will buy it. Uh, that's the point for today, and we will illustrate that uh, how how you can make use of those in, uh, interesting and useful information. Actually, what you need are modeling techniques, statistical modeling techniques that make use of the data. And there are three golden rules you need to comply in order to gain really great insights. The first one is causation. Build causation. Build on causation and correlation. Second, really measure total impacts, not just direct impacts. Regression is doing direct impacts. And third, be able to explore unknown nonlinearities and unknown interactions. And most of you know that implicit data are full of nonlinearities. So um, before we get into the, the examples, let me quickly uh, illustrate uh, how the method looks like who can basically comply with this role model. There's basically just one methodology, it's called universal structure modeling, which really uh, compiles to all three, uh, and it is implemented in the industrial software. So what it is that doing is it takes the data, the data of, of success drivers as well as measures of success, and you connect them, so you allow the method to be uh, to assume causal co uh, connection between them. And you can also eliminate those which obviously does not make sense at all. Then the software quantifies how things relate to each other. And it, it makes use of uh, machine learning techniques. So for the quants in the room, it can be seen uh, like a structural equation modeling approach uh, improved by machine learning technique. Plus, simulation techniques that overcome the black box issue of machine learning. Uh, this is uh, uh, what, what is inside the machine room doing, but then, as a service that you really need those simulation techniques to really understand how important a certain uh, emotion is, how important a certain success factor is, and <coughs> to visualize to make us understand. So that's uh, the more theoretical part but that's, that's core to, to understand how, how we proceed in, in analyzing the data. Let's look at the first two case studies. They are, they are complying to the rule number one, build on causation and correlation. The rule basically states that any correlation are possibly misleading and leads to wrong conclusion. We found actually that 50% of correlations uh, lead to, to uh, wrong conclusions. Uh, most of you know the phenomenon of uh, spurious correlation, but in fact, it's a first forgotten when entering business life. Um, or as Sherlock Holmes would have said it, there's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. Let's look into an example. Thanks, Mike. Um, I said I could do five minutes. Um, to illustrate the issue 
issue about exploitation of correlation, but sometimes about the impact of emotions on my decision. Pretty new study, only six months out. Uh, what we have done, we try to investigate what type of color preferences are really interesting based on some kind of patient expression analysis. So we basically did done a um, lab study uh, with uh, 40 students, participants, and total. Um, they were running the assigned two products. Oh, my favorite one. Yes, Holly and the Vecna product. And during the process of showing the picture of the product, we assessed their facial expressions. Basically, this is a really small structural equation modeling. Um, however, we can find some really nice inside. So, this is the angular concept discussed fear, joy, sad, surprise, and neutral emotions based on the facial coding system as invented by uh, Paul Heckman, and probably everybody knows. And we uh, hypothesized that there's that some kind of relation between those kind of emotions and the buying decision at the end. Because afterwards, after the study, the subjects get a voucher from us and they were able to decide which kind of pro uh, product we would like to get as a gift from us. That was the basic idea. And right now, in the picture, you also get the typical or classical correlation analysis. You see that the more yellow brown color. Uh, we see there's only two, three, or there are only two, uh, three um, correlations. One discussed, sad and, and uh, surprise and neutral. Very small one on a low level, however, and then some kind of picture. But when we put the data into a more advanced modeling, like the USM technique, uh, we found out that all those emotions are related to the bike position at the end of the day. Basically, we can predict four or five. Drug choices. This is those kind of modeling. So, for me, because it's a really new study, I was really surprised and also happy to get those kind of really good data, but only because we use those kind of analysis techniques. Otherwise, based on the simple correlation analysis, we would not better, not better than the random choice model. The next study is a little bit older. It's about um, the influence or the effect of user experience on product certification as a key subject. Indicator. Um, we've done a start, another lab study with 90 patterns, with 90, 19 subjects, which were only choose to two products, the Samsung Galaxy S4 or the iPhone 5. As you can see, it's a little bit older, three years old. However, we got some really nice insights. Our simple but basic um, UX modeling was based on workflows in Arugula and our implicit indications. Uh, based on EEG measurement and EDA, and the classical uh, usefulness and ease of use, self report manner in order to determine the user experience. So, right here, when we take a closer look to the correlation analysis, we see many, many correlations, as most of the data predict are. However, when we took a look at the data into the good and modeling, we only found one significant driver, and that's the workflow. Right. Negative the higher the level, the, the lower the chance that the, the subject will be happy with the product at the end of the day. That makes sense. Okay. Maybe you remember the book by Steve Proof from 2000, Don't Need to Think. That's the thing. Don't need to think. Don't need to think. That's the, the, the most important rule. We like some other, other rules for user experience. That's it. Um, that was a little bit more of the data part. And uh, just to illustrate how. What's the secret behind those kind of techniques? Uh, Frank is showing you uh, um, in detail right now. Yeah, you may, you may ask yourself, yeah, how this magical machine finds it out that only workload is really important that drives product, uh, product satisfaction. And I will show you this by applying the most simple technique. It's called multiple regression. It is a uh, technique which uses, uh, let's imagine, there are two success factors. Yeah. There is uh, usefulness, and there is workload. Okay? And the third is the success of product satisfaction. We have the same dimension. So we have first, what those parameters are the height, the general product satisfaction, second is the importance of usefulness, second or third is the importance of workload. And this are the respondents, not so satisfied, very satisfied. And you see, it correlates. Yeah? The more uh, usefulness, the more product 
starts the infection, it correlates. However, if you use this simple technique, it fits the data, yeah? it builds the model that can predict the outcome. And you see that the parameter for usefulness is zero, but the, the one for workload is, is high. Very simple. Uh, that's the most simple technique to find out what are the direct effects towards the outcome. And we get a little bit more uh, magic uh, in a bit. Um, but what you find here are just the direct impacts, the direct effect towards the outcome. As you remember, there is the rule number two. You need to understand the total impact, not just the direct impact. It's, it's like the sound. The sound, like in a great console hall, it emerges through a lot of reflect, reflections. Without reflection, it would sound very different. And this is the same with, with calls and modeling, what we do. Uh, we found that at least 50% are explained uh, by indirect effects, which are, you are not so much aware of. And for, for this, we have another interesting study, which uh, we will show Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, so, so this raises the topic about the total of direct effects. Um, I choose the study I will conduct about 20 to 39 to see the ball brand positioning, especially the focus on the brand vision motivation on brand, on brand perception and behavior. And in this case, we chose the continental time brand, the two-year time brand, they offer a lot of product. But in this case, I was focusing on the two-year time um, unit. And uh, that's basically our, our modeling. It's a little bit complex, maybe. That might be the business, by the way. However, um, I tried to illustrate a little bit. So, as an as indicator, success indicator, we use the red weighted motivation once on an implicit level. Therefore, we use a reaction time measurement on a particular technique because it's so easy to use and really powerful. And an explicit uh, sample report as well. Then we show some kind of classical, typical KPIs like brand image, brand action, brand class, brand loyalty, pricing, as well as white detection at the end of the day. And we illustrate or we have a that have a lot of directional impacts on about 27 years to take all the direct effects together. However, when we take a close look first into the empirical data, sorry, there we can only see 14 direct impacts. So in the case of implicit data, new marketing data, you already could argue all of that some kind of impact on brand image. But then we stop. However, we can see a lot of indirect effects, which make them in total the uh, total effect combined with direct effects. So, for example, we have an impact from brand new motivation on an implicit level on brand, brand image, as well as brand content, from uh, brand loyalty, and buying attention at the end of the day. So, to make it a little more illustration, a little bit more better, we can hear or we can capture the direct and total effect, as we have seen, there's only one direct effect from the implicit brand with motivation uh, on brand image, but at the end, when we take all the effects together, we can see that the implicit data predicts or explains uh, the all facets of brand perception behavior. But that was only possible because we used first the first interesting modeling approach, and second, we took all the effects together. All right, and there's the rule number three. So it is about, you need to explore unexpected nonlinearities and unexpected interactions. Why is it? Why is it so important? Because the reality looks like that. Let's take this tree. According to conventional statistical modeling, it would be growing perfectly in the desert. Why? The lack of water is overcompensated by a lot of sun. Right? It would grow perfectly. Of course, this is ridiculous. Um, yeah, there is no single importance of sun, and there is no single importance of water. You need both at the same time in order to grow the plant, the tree. So the statistical term is there is an interaction. And most of the time, we are not aware of those interactions in, in real life. So we need a method which helps you find that out, of 
data. The same is for uh, nonlinearity. If you have nonlinearity, your more sun is good, but too much sun isn't good, right? It's like uh, we have always said uh, in real life: if you give too much product samples in stores, uh, it's also not good. It substitutes your sales at a certain point of time, but you already only know it after analyzing the data, right? Let's look into a case study where this plays a crucial role. The case study is about Sonos. I'm sure most of you know Sonos. It is the inventor of the wireless multi-room uh, multi home body category. And they, when they, they grew, they got the feeling that they need, need to reassess really what, what drives what drives customers uh, to buy such, such a category for us. And what we did was we took a brand, uh, brand driver study and had an implicit uh, association test running with it. Uh, I don't want to share all the details, but just pick one interesting example. We found that the relaxing motion is very important. I, I was uh, thinking up from speakers, it must be like loud, party, um, you know, something like that, but it's not. What you see here is the causal separated effect of the relaxing, the relaxing motion towards the change in considera brand consideration. So it's not a scatter plot, it's a separated effect. And when you see at the dot, you immediately see that a conventional linear modeling would have found nothing. Flat. It's not important. But indeed, we found that there is an effect, there's a large effect for those guys, for those who um, have an association with the brand that the, the association with the brand is not relaxed at all. So, when driving or when doing communication, you should avoid heavy, heavy, uh, or heavy metal style emotion. It's not important to be the perfect uh, mediator or the perfect uh, relaxed uh, emotion. Uh, that's not what drives the mass of sales, but it's important to prevent the, the party like emotion, strong, non relaxed emotion. And we found that without knowing it upfront, so the method can extract those findings which you haven't expected. And we have, haven't expected another thing. There is, a, there is an interaction with a certain subgroup uh, of the target group who loves relaxation. For them, it can't be more relaxed. So uh, this is an interaction. It's like the water of the, of the plant. Uh, for them, there, there is a certain subgroup which is categorized some, with some attitude and items where we found they have very different importance. There is a very different impact pattern of, of this emotion. And the, the thing is, with conventional method, you are not able to find them because you always need to hypothesize a one talking point. This is the strength of exploring and using machine learning techniques. So you uh, may ask, what's the use of it? The users make better decisions. Statistically speaking, uh, the validity, increase in validity is 60% over linear methods. This is already advanced and nobody, not everyone uses that. 60% better direct effects. And because of the, we understand and measure the total effect, we have three times better, measurable, better, uh, more better insights, which that then drives, drives sales afterwards. Let's have a look what Sonos did with the findings. This is the advertising before our study. Uh, the creatives made 
up a very different campaign, which um, conveys a kind of related emotion, and it also conveys uh, the reason why to, uh, Sonos provides a great song experience and the modular, the, the YouTube modular feature. So let's have a look at this new commercial. Music is not a house plan. It shouldn't just stay in one room. I want rock in the kitchen, soul in the bedroom, and blues in the whole house. Model with more flexibility how the reality really looks like. 